Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, welcome. And, uh, and thanks for joining everyone. Maharaj, you can start uh, the class. Uh, I think many of them will join later because they have to come back to Kampar. Okay, we'll just and begin. We will be joining later because he's on the way from Kampar. They're on the way, eh? So we'll just begin. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Koravani Pracharine Nirvasesha Shunyavadi Paschacha De Satarine Vanchakaupa Terubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadhadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So welcome everyone to our Bhakti by Bhav class where we're studying Srimad Bhagavatam and we're on Canto 6, chapter number 8 and 9 tonight. So, first of all, we're dealing with chapter 8, which is the Narayana Kavacha. So you'll remember in the last class we spoke about how the, the demigods had a problem. I, I'm giving class now. I, you have to, I, I don't need any more tonight. Thank you. I just. Um, okay, tomorrow morning. You need all all out. Huh? Cloth needs kurta. Oh, okay. Tomorrow. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So Hare Krishna. Uh, sorry for the interac in in interaction. We're hearing about uh, the appearance of the demon Vritasura. First of all, however. We heard how the demigods had insulted Brihaspati, Indra had neglected Brihaspati who had come there. And because of his offence to Brihaspati, Brihaspati left and then disappeared. They couldn't find him. And then the, the, demi, the, the demons came and attacked and they defeated the demigods. So the demigods were in great trouble. And they couldn't understand how they could be defeated by the demons because usually demigods can defeat the demons. But because they've offended their guru, they couldn't. And the demons, they had been faithful to their guru, Sukracharya, and so they came out victorious. So then they approach. 
they approach the Lord. Is it? What happened? What I, I'm forgetting now exactly what happened there at the end of the seventh chapter. Let's see. Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj, they yeah. approach Lord Brahma and Brahma asks them to go and take, uh, accept uh, Vishwarupa as their uh, spiritual master. They should take Vishwarupa, right, thank you, right, they were to take Vishwarupa as their spiritual master, yes. Take Vishwarup. They need a guru. They have no guru, right? So, they have to take a, a spiritual master. So, they, they approach Vishwarup. Vishwarup, but they were warned that be careful. Don't, that, that he, be careful because what was the problem with Vi Vishwarup? He was related from his mother's side uh, to a demoness, this thing, so he will take care of the demons. He will also be uh, giving uh, some benefit to the demons also. Right, yes. Brahmaji said you tolerate it, like you try to tolerate it. He will be having soft corner for them. <laughs> Yeah, just tolerate it, yeah. <laughs> but, anyway, okay, so that was it. They heard also about the, the, the Narayana Kavacha. He gave the demigods the Narayana Kavacha armor, right? That was called, described at the end of the seventh chapter, wasn't it? That, well, of course, he hadn't given, he was going to give it to them anyway. Uh, Vishwarup, most powerful, Give the give the armor to the king of heaven. And in this way he can conquer the demons. So then chapter eight goes on and we hear about Maharaj Pariksit inquiring from Sukadeva Goswami. He wants to know, explain this Vishnu mantra, Arma that protected Indra and enabled him to defeat his enemies. So, Sukadev Goswami tells about this armor. Then he tells how to put the armor on. He describes, right? You have to first of all chant. You should chant Om Namo Narayanaya, first of all. First of all, chanting, well, first. First one has to do Akshman and sit on the kusha grass and chant Om Namo Narayanaya and touch different parts of the body. Place the mantra on different parts of the body, different syllables on different parts of the body. And then you have to chant the other mantra, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. And First of all, you place that mantra on the fingers and then you chant Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya and place it on the body, different parts of the body. And this way, it becomes like an, an armor protecting the body. But then you have to recite the prayers also. There's the prayers of the Narayana Kavacha. So this, these prayers are actually prayers offered to different incarnations of the Lord and they request for protection from these different incarnations. I remember sometimes devotees will chant this Narayana Kavacha when they're in a very dangerous situation. Some devotees there were I remember and just after Prabhupada had left the planet, you know, when the great Acharya leaves the world, when Srila Prabhupada departed from the world, 
So it's very difficult. There's always a lot of tension and a lot of problems. A great Acharya left the planet. So there was a lot of problems and we had very big problem over in Mumbai. And what, what happened, some people had come and they attacked the temple, there's a big fight and somehow I think one of the guards or something there who was working there, he had hit one of the pit people who had come and it, who was attacking the temple and the person died. So several people got put in, in jail, people who were all there, who were involved there, they were arrested and they were put inside the prison. So it was very terrible for them. So the devotees were all chanting Narayana Kavacha. That, that was uh, being done every day by the devotees, I think twice a day. So it's described here how, how you do it. You put the mantra first of all on the body, chant Om Namo Narayanaya, and then chant Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, and then, then Om Astrayafat, in different directions, right? And then you have to chant the prayers to all these different deities, different avatars of the Lord mentioned the, the you pray to Matsya to protect you in water because Matsya avatar appeared to save the Satyavrat and the other people at the time of the devastation when the earth was inundated by the flood. So Satyavrat was told to gather everything and the, a boat came and, and they attached the boat to the uh, to the this to this much avatar who pulled it through the water of devastation. So you pray to Machia and they pray to Vamana on the land and many different incarnations of the Lord are mentioned. And pray to Lord Nishingadev also. And this way you can get protection even in Actually, the mantra is, it describes it can protect you even if you're difficult, a dangerous disease. So, if we were all, if we wanted to protect ourselves from this COVID virus, you could chant this Narayana Kavacha if you wanted. It could protect you from the danger of this COVID virus, which is affecting the whole world just now. Because one of the things that can protect you from is disease. All right, so well, let me see. Maybe I should share the screen. Huh? Let's share the screen. Okay. You can see the text now. Yes, my all right, so Vishwarupa is giving this mantra to Indra. The different syllables, the, the, what is it, the, the, the eight-syllable mantra, and then the twelve-syllable mantra, and then six-syllable mantra, right? Six-syllable mantra on Vishnave Nama. That's also chanted. Mm. These different mantras all help to make the armour to protect the body. It's very subtle, you see, it's very subtle. Just like previously we were hearing about the, uh, the weapons released by Ashwatthama, right? The Brahmastra weapons, they're very subtle. They were re released by mantra. So here we have also the use of mantra. Prabhupada said, just like when we do initiation, when we have initiations, we all chant that mantra uh, that uh, we will always, whether purified or unpurified, we should remember uh, the Lord, lotus-eyed Lord. And then Prabhupada said, this is subtle, 
you chant the mantras, the sound vibration invokes protection from the inauspiciousness. So here also, this is uh, Narayana Kavacha Mantra, it's very subtle, mentions about praying to Sanat Kumar to protect us from lusty desires, right? Sanat Kumar, one of the great four Kumaras. So four Kumaras, they're, young, they're the oldest, but they remain always Brahmachari. So like that one may be wanting to conquer over his lusty desires, we can pray to Sanat Kumar and we can pray to Danvantari, we have some health problem, so Danvantari is there, he can cure our disease. And Vyasadeva, he mentions praying to Vyasadeva will protect us from all kinds of ignorance because Srila Vyasadeva compiled so many scriptures. Then coming up to text number uh, 19, talks about also Lord Buddha because it mentions uh, may Lord Buddha Dev protect me from activities opposed to Vedic principles and from laziness that causes one to madly forget the Vedic principles of knowledge and ritualistic action. So the, the Buddhists Prabhupada talks about the mission of Lord Buddha to save people from the abominable activity of animal killing. One should therefore surrender to Lord Buddha so that he can help one avoid misusing the injunctions of the Vedas. <laughs> Prabhupada saying like this, usually we don't speak about the Buddhas, and we don't celebrate Lord Buddha's appearance day, we don't celebrate any of these Buddhist festivals. We don't, we don't even go to Buddhist temples, it's said it's not good to go to Buddhist temples. They're not, it's not good for our consciousness. But here, talk, they're talk, Prabhupada's talking that, okay, Lord Buddha, if it will help us to uh, avoid misusing the injunctions of the Vedas. And Prabhupada writes in the purport, as Kali, as Kali Yuga advances, many pseudo-religious principles will certainly be introduced and people will forget the real religious principles enunciated by Lord Krishna before the beginning of Kali Yuga. So before the beginning of Kali Yuga, what was the real religious principle? What do you think? What should be the real religious principle before the Kali Yuga? Deity worship. Yeah, that was there, deity worship. But Prabhupada doesn't talk about that actually. He's, he talks about simply surrender to Krishna. It said before the Kali Yuga, foolish people. Well, I said, because of Kali Yuga, foolish people do not surrender to Krishna. Every day they manufacture a new type of dharma on the plea that whatever one manufactures is also a path of liberation. Atheistic men generally say, and then Prabhupada quotes that Bengali saying, yata mata tata pata, right? Many paths all lead to the same place. <laughs> so this bogus philosophy, so much bogus philosophy is propagated in the Kali Yuga. And Prabhupada says like the hundreds and thousands of different opinions in human society and each opinion is a valid religious principle. This philosophy of rascals 
has killed the religious principles mentioned in the Vedas. So this is a problem. Kali Yuga, as Kali Yuga progresses, people will become more and more atheistic and against the devotees of the Lord. And pseudo-religion will become more and more prominent. They will forget the real purpose, what is the real goal of religion. So we see it happening every day. We see these different, we hear about these different bogus philosophies, more and more nonsense people come by and, you know, they say, Manava Seva, Madhava Seva. They say these kind of things, you know, they say, <laughs> they talk about, God is a poor man, God is in the street, Daridra Narayan, they say like that, Narayan is a poor man. All nonsense, bogus philosophies. And people are thinking, oh, very nice. You know, think, oh, he's a real holy man, because he's speaking like this. So people are, they want to be cheated, they get a cheater. That's what happens. The Kali Yuga, very common. So, Lord Buddha, he came to trick the people also. He came to cheat the people because they were all atheists, they didn't believe in any God. So, he, so Buddha didn't teach anything about God. He didn't teach about the soul, he didn't teach about God. And he, he got so many followers because people they were all atheists, so Lord Buddha came to cheat these atheistic people to, and to save them, to give them a better life. Before they were, had all been killing animals in the name of religion. So that was the worst thing. So Lord Buddha came to stop that. But in the Kali Yuga, in the Kali Yuga is much worse. Of course, Lord Buddha came at the beginning of Kali Yuga, but as after, now that he's gone already 2,000 more years since he's disappeared, it's become much worse. There's so much more killing going on in the name of, even in the name of religion. So, we try to preach against it. So, Kali Yuga progresses. Prabhupada told us, he said, by the end of the Kali Yuga, though, you know, nobody will ever utter the name of God. The Kali, by the end of the Kali Yuga, the world will be so bad, everybody, the people surviving will live under the ground, will never see the light of the sun. They'll live in darkness. And you can see a lot of, a lot of it's already happening. We have undergrounds and tunnels everywhere in the darkness and we think it's in the name of advancement. We go in the subway, ride the subways, just like in New York, you have the subway through the cities and people live in the subways, they have nowhere to go, so they just live in the subways. So, Kali Yuga. Okay, we'll go ahead. So, the Lord prays about different times of the day to be protected. Yeah, we want to be protected different times of the day. Some times of the day are good, but some times are not. Text number 23 talks about Surasan Chakra. He said, just like the fire burns dry grass to ashes with a little breeze, so the Surasan Chakra will burn our enemies to ashes. So you can see that the mood of these demigods, you know, that they've got enemies. They're, they're, they're worried, they, they want to remove their enemies.
So the the Narayana Kavacha prayers are all it's all devote you know, prayers offered to the different incarnations of 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 Lord Vishnu or Lord Krishna. In different times of the day, you can see it's a Narayana Kavacha, very powerful, but it's material. It's not going to get you Krishna. It's not a prayer for Krishna consciousness. It's for people who are in danger, who've got some serious problem they want to overcome. Then they can chant this mantra. In text 29, the prayer is to Lord Garuda, for he is powerful. He's as powerful as the Lord Himself. He is the personified Vedas and is worshipped by selected verses. May He protect us from all dangerous conditions. So, Lord Garuda, very powerful. We, we often, we have, in Mayapur, we have the Garuda Stamba. And in Jagannath Puri, Lord Chaitanya always used to view Jagannath from the Garuda Stamba, the temple. Oh, in text 19, they talk about Ahangrahopasana, right? That. Uh, That's, that, that is the uh, part of the mantra, part of chanting the mantra, that you have to do this, you have to uh, think of yourself qualitative, qualitatively one with the Lord, right? Ahangrahopasana, it's in, going back there, text number, where is it, text number 11, is it? Oh, here it is, text number 12. In text number 12, it says, Thinking oneself one with the Supreme is called Ahangrahopasana. This is something which we should be familiar with, right? Now, it's a, it's a method of self-realization. It's not recommended for us, but it's one of the processes. It's mentioned in Bhagavad Gita. Have you seen, have you come across it in Bhagavad Gita? The Sahangraho Pasana? Anybody? Do you know this from Bhagavad Gita? Yes. Advita Mithima Bhannam. Where? Avitam Victima Venem Manende Mama Muteha, Parempao Ajananda Mama Vimanitama. Seventh chapter. What's the verse? Can you give me the translation? Who's the red me when they and the Abijananti Mudha? You're saying that verse, are you? No, I was saying Avijanti Mutha is in the 8th chapter. Oh, you're saying in the 7th chapter. Oh, Advaita. You don't know the English. You only know the Sanskrit. No, the sloka is that word. Avijanti Mutha is in the 7th chapter. And that, do you think I have assumed this form? Right? What's it, which verse is it in the seventh chapter?
That's not the verse I was thinking of, though. I was thinking of a verse in the ninth chapter. There's a verse in the ninth chapter which is more an indication of this Ahangra Hopasana. In the ninth, if you, in the ninth chapter, verse number fifteen, it mentions Jnana yagena chapyanye jantu mamu pasite ekat vena pritat vena bahuda vishvato mukha ekat vena ekat vena pritat vena bahuda vishvato mukha. Do you know this verse? Ekat vena, the one, right? The, all the philosophies are in this one one verse. Ekatvena means monism. Pretakvena dualism. And Bahumukha that is pantheism. Seeing the world as God. So the Ekatvena, this is ahang Ahangrahopasana. We're thinking ourselves one, to be one with God. The ninth chapter, Bhagavad Gita, verse number 15. Have you got it? Yes, Maharaj. Ekatvena pritakvena bahuda vishvatomukha. Ekatvena is monism, and that's ahangrahopasana. Right? It's described here. Ahangra Upasana. Describe thinking oneself one with God. So the Mayavadis they do like that. They will do through Ahangra Upasana. But Prabhupada mentions that you don't become God, but you think of himself as qualitatively one with the Supreme. You don't become the God. <laughs> so this is this is the Ahangraho Pasana which is mentioned. And the monists they, they they like that, you know what? They like the idea to become God. Become one with God. They don't have the mood of service. You know, Shankaracharya, of course, he promoted this monism. All right? So the monism, they want to become the, they think of themselves one, but we're one with the Supreme. One in quality, but not in quantity. So that's an important point. So it's good for you to know that this is also mentioned in Bhagavad Gita. Look, what happened was Lord Krishna was describing, in the ninth chapter, he was describing the Mahatmas. And then he said, well, apart from other, there's others who take to the process of knowledge. So they're not as advanced as those who do devotional service, you know. And in, this, in the seventh chapter, he described devotees who devotional service with material desires. Chatur Vida Bijanti Mam Jnana Sukritino Arjuna Arto Jignasur Artarti Jnani Chabharatarshaba. Four kinds of pious people come to devotional service. Right? The distressed, the one in search of wealth, the inquisitive and those with not in search of knowledge, the knowledge of the Absolute Truth. So those people, they're not pure devotees, they're not Mahatmas, but they've come to Krishna Consciousness. So they're pious, they're good people, they're mixed devotees. But then there's people further down the scale, they're not even mixed devotees, but they they're, they're have some attraction, some interest. So Lord Krishna describes them, ekat vena, pritat vena, bahuda vishvaktomukha. And he says that ekat vena, that's the most common, the most prominent, the most common. These people who have this idea of monism, becoming one, described here, ahangraho pasana. 
thinking, I'm God, I'm one with the universe. It's the most common and it's the most fallen. <laughs> it's the worst one of the three. The three is meant, the other one is worshipping the demigods and then one is worshipping the universal form. So they're better than worshipping God, thinking that you can become God. Mm -hmm. Is it clear? Any question about the hunger hope asana? Are you okay on it? No answers. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. So yes. this, uh, uh, those who are Maya Vadi, they think that they have become God. They do this hunger hope asana. They come in that category. Yeah. Well, the my if, if that's the mood if they're thinking like that, then they. They're thinking themselves to be one with God, yeah, then it's ahangra hopasana, ekat vena, yeah. Prabhupada said it's very prominent, very common. I was like that before I became a devotee. I, I, it's very common. You read what you read all the books by any all these people, these books on the market, this is what most people write about. You know, that we're, we're all God, that we're one with the universe, we're all God, that everybody's God. You know. So, the, oh, many of the different gurus are coming. You know, when Prabhupada came to America, when he came to America, they arranged a press conference and the reporters were asking him, Are you also God Swamiji? And, and they said, because all the other people who came, they all told us they were God. So are you also God? <laughs> so Prabhupada told them, no, I'm not God. I am merely a servant of God. But then he said, I'm not even a servant of God. To be a servant of God is a great thing. I'm trying to be a servant of God. So like that. Hmm. Okay, so we read about the, at, at the end of the chapter, after describing the mantra, uh, they speak about how powerful this mantra is, right? Do you, did, did you get the example what happened to show the power of this kavacha? Yes. Shukadeva <coughs> Goswami gives the, I mean, uh, is, gives the example of a, a Brahmana named Kaushika. Yes. Who, who chanted this, uh, I mean, uh, this Narayana Kavacha and uh, it became powerful. That's right. Yes. The power of the mantra is described in text 37. It said, one who employs this prayer is never disturbed or put in danger by the government, by plunderers, by evil demons, or by any type of disease. <coughs> so this is the real panacea, right? Do you want some cure? You know, they're, they're all trying to invent some vaccines and everything. They're giving everybody injections nowadays, vaccines. Here we have the mantra, powerful mantra, can protect us from any kind of disease. And so many other evil things can protect us. So then Sukadeva Goswami tells us about this Koshika, right? And he gave up his body in the desert. And then this king, great king was coming by on his aeroplane, king of the Gandharvas, Chitrarat was coming in his aeroplane with many beautiful women because he's coming from Gandharva Loka. He's the king of the Gandharvas and he's got all these beautiful women who sing and dance and they were traveling on the aeroplane. But when they crossed over where the bones of the Brahmin were, 
then the airplane crashed down and he and then king king chitrarata he crashed down on his head he came head down and then he was ordered by demigods the different demigods named the valiki Val, Valakilyas to throw the Brahmana's bones in the river Saraswati nearby. So, so this king had to go and imagine the king has to take the bones, you know. King is such a big man, important man. And he was king of the Gandharvaloka, but he was ordered, you take these bones and go and put them in the, in the Saraswati. Don't leave them there. So he'd fallen from his aeroplane, he couldn't get back in his aeroplane, he had to walk home. <laughs> I don't know how he got to, Gandhar to Gandharva Loka after that. Okay. So Sukadeva Goswami says, this one who uses this armor is never afraid because any condition in the material world is free from all danger. And and, and is worshipped by all living entities. So in this way, Indra uses the mantra and he conquers the demons and enjoys all the opulence of the three worlds. So Indra is able to get back the heavenly planets for his enjoyment. So Prabhupada talks about taking initiation, must receive all kinds of mantras from a bona fide spiritual master. Otherwise the mantras will not be fruitful. Sampradaya vihina ye mantraste nishvala mata. Right? It will not bear any fruit. If you don't get the mantra through the disciplic succession, it will be useless. So how is it, you can see how this is relevant for us, this account about the Narayana Kavacha. Chanting Hare Krishna every morning and putting on tilak, marking our body with tilak, that's our armour. We mark the body with tilak and then we sit and chant Hare Krishna mantra or we go to Mongol Arti and chant there. That's the armour for the devotees which will protect us from all inauspiciousness. Everything will become auspicious if we do these things. You go to Mangalarti, you chant the Mahamantra. If you spend the, in the morning, if you spend like three, four hours in the morning doing sadhana, then it will keep us strong all day. You can face all the maya. You don't have to be disturbed. So this is the power of the these mantras, just like here in Srimad Bhagavatam, we're hearing how the demigods are protected by mantra. So we're also protected by mantra, not only mantra, mantra and songs and like that. We sing these different songs, they're all prayers, they're protecting us. Okay, we'll go ahead to chapter 9 and we'll hear about the appearance of the demon Vritasura. Yes? Um, so just a question on uh, the cover chat. That's so, I mean, you see that uh, in the first canto could be general space for troubles and uh, uh, calamities to come again and again. And we also see that in the, the Kaitava Dharma is described where anything with the fruit of action is rejected from the Bhagavatam. But at the same time, we see a lot of Palashrutis and we see such kind of cover charts to protect one's body and to protect one from disease. So how are we supposed to correlate to both of these opposites as such? Well, it's, everything is up to the individual, you know. We don't have any legislation about people wearing kavachas or worshipping kavachas. It's up to the individual. It's not part, generally it's not really part of the ISKCON program. 
You know, we have our own morning program, our sadhana, Mongo Arti, Tosi Puja, Guru Puja, Bhagavatam, <laughs> Japa. You know, that's our armour, that's how we get our protection, that's where our armour lies. We don't need all these other things. Other people, you know, some people like to do it, you know, they they like, they enjoy it, it gives them some pleasure, some satisfaction to sit and chant these prayers and do these mantras every day. But it's not really part of the Bhakti Yoga program. Bhakti Yoga program is based on hearing and chanting and worshipping. Worship, worshipping the deities. So we don't really need these kavacha and things. When Prabhupada was sick, sometimes he would send devotees, he said, go to the doctor, go and see this doctor, or go and see the astrologer, see what the astrologer says. And when the devotee would come back and see what the astrologer had said, Prabhupada would laugh. <laughs> he would just laugh, he would say, just listen to what he's telling me to do. You know, they would tell him, you have to get this ring, you have to buy this, you know, do this yagya, feed these brahmins or something. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, our medicine is the Hare, Hare Krishna mantra. We will chant the holy. He said, that is the real medicine for deliverance. From all inauspiciousness, just take shelter of the holy name. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll go ahead. This next chapter is a very important one, very interesting one also. A lot of things in it. We hear, first of all, uh, so Vishwarup is the priest of the demigods and he's doing the worship on behalf of the demigods. But, because he has some affection for his mother's side, remember his mother is the daughter of the Daityas, so he's offering oblations on behalf of the demigods. Om Ganeshaya Namaha, Om Shivaya Namaha, Om Dargaya Namaha. But in, then quietly he was offering to the demons. You know, very, he, he didn't let them. But then Indra, Indra found out. Somehow Indra was, must have been watching or he was watching very, and he saw that, oh, that this, this, this Vishwarup, he's offering to the demons. And the demons will become, Indra was worried because Indra is the king of heaven. And he knows if the demons become powerful, they'll come and take away his position. So he's got a lot to lose. He was the one who had hired Vishwarup. And he sees Vishwarup offering to the demons, so Indra decides he has to kill him. And he cuts off his heads. Vishwarup had three heads, and Indra cut the three of them, three heads off. So, because Vishwarup's a Brahmana, it's quite an, a big offence on the part of Indra. So Indra had to, he, what to do, you know, he, Indra was powerful, but he decided better to accept the reactions for what he'd done. And so for one year he suffered and he had to go and do penances and just suffering for one year. And then after one year he came back and he decided one year, he said a lot of the reactions have been reduced now because I've been suffering for one year so I won't have so much serious reaction. And we thought, what, what karma is left, I'll give it to others. So it's mentioned how he divided the karma between different elements like the earth and water and then women and then trees. He gave it to women, he gave it to trees and he, he, he gave them one-fourth of the karma which was remaining on him, he gave them one-fourth each of the karma he was supposed to get. So one-fourth went to the trees, one-fourth went to water, one-fourth went to the earth, and one-fourth went to the uh, women. Women, the trees, earth, 
and water. So he gave the, the karma to them and that because they took karma from, they had to suffer, they took some reactions, some of the sin for Indra. So Indra had given the sin to them, but he still had the subtle desire of sin within him. And remember, he killed a brahmana. So I, although he gave away the sinful reactions to these other, to the earth and water and to the women and to trees, he still had the subtle desire to sin. Therefore, you will see later on he kills another brahmana. <laughs> He kills another brother. Killing Vishwarup wasn't enough. He still had, had it awakened within him the desire to kill another Brahman. And after he killed Vish, uh, Vishwarup, later on he kills Vritasura also. So it's described uh, because Indra killed Vishwarup, the father of Vishwarup, Twasta was very angry and Twasta was a very powerful personality. He was the direct son of Kashyapa and Aditi. Do you remember Kashyapa and Aditi? They were, you know, they're like the mother, of, Aditi is the mother of the demigods. So, you know, she, she was, they were good people. So, uh, Vishwarup was with the, he was from their family, but Indra had killed him. So Twashta, Twashta was the son, he was first, he was the father of Vishwarup. So Twashta is very angry. So he does a, a yagya and he wants to create, he wants to create a demon to kill Indra. But he chanted the mantra wrong. He made a mistake in chanting the mantra. He was supposed to chant it, was a, supposed to be a long sound, and instead, no, it was supposed to be a short sound, but instead he chanted a long sound. So, because he made a mistake in the mantra, he didn't get somebody who would kill Indra, he got somebody who was, who was going to kill, is who Indra is going to kill. Indra becomes the killer. Indra was meant to be killed, but instead Indra becomes a killer. And Indra kills this person who takes birth. So, Indra kills Vritasura, in other words. But it's not easy. It's not easy. What happens, first of all, is the, uh, the demigods have to, the, the demigods, well Indra has killed Vishwarup and then Vishwarup has created, not Vishwarup, Vishwarup's father, Twashta, he's created the big demon. He did a yagya to get a, de to get a son who would kill Indra. So he got this huge demon, Vrita. Vrita means one who covers everything. So he covers everybody's knowledge, he covers everyone. His huge, gigantic form and terrifying. So all the demigods, they came to attack him. And the demigods, they have a lot of weapons. And they were firing their weapons at this Vritasura. And Vritasura just swallows them. He just swallows all their weapons. So then the demigods are really worried. So what are they going to do? What do you do when you're in trouble? Where do you go? What do you do? What do you think? You take the shelter of the Supreme Lord. Yes, you have to take shelter of the Supreme Lord. That's a fact. You have to take shelter of the Lord. So? How do you do it? Where is he? How do you find him? By going to the spiritual master. <laughs> yeah. We can say prayers. Right, prayer, right. 
Yeah, and that's, of course, that's what the demigods did. They, be, they begin by offering prayers to, who are they praying to? Lord Vishnu Maharaj. Yeah, they're praying to the super soul, right? The Lord in the heart. They pray to the super soul. And then they're praying, in the beginning they're praying, and the Lord then appears to them. The Lord appears in front of them. And so that then they continue to offer prayers. And you have, the, you have the, these uh, demigods offering prayers to the Supreme, to the Paramatma, to the, form, the Lord in the form of Paramatma. And of course their prayers are for protection. They, they, they want protection because this Vritasura is just so gigantic, he's, he's just terrifying. And they can't do anything about him, their weapons are useless. So they're praying, they've come to pray to the Lord to ask his help. But is the Lord ready to help them? <laughs> we will see in his prayers. Right? We have many prayers to go through. I thought what we might do, we'll ask, maybe we could do some group work here and you can give some, you can give some of the uh, information. Right? Do we have somebody here to put the devotees in groups? Who does that? Is it, yes, you can, you can do that Prabhu. Okay, how many people do we have today? We have 19, so means we have 18 devotees. Okay. Uh, can I make four groups, Maharaj? Okay, four groups would be nice, yeah. Okay, Maharaj. Okay, we have some nice questions. If we look at the questions, uh, I thought, well, one question, one group can work on question number five. Que have you got these questions, the Purva Swadhyaya? Do you have these questions with you? Yes, Maharaj. Some philosophers advocate that Prakriti and Purusha are the cause of the universal creation. What is the Vaishnava response to this claim? Right? So group one can work on question number five, and then group two can work on question number ten. What is the difference between Sakama and Akama devotees, and what are the spiritual disadvantages of being a Sakama devotee? That will be group number two. Then group number three, they can do uh, question number uh, question number 14, in, in what way was the Lord dissatisfied with the demigods? And then group four will do question 15. How does Krishna reciprocate when someone approaches him to fulfill material desires? Is it clear? Each group knows what they have to do? It's marriage. How much time do you need? Five minutes? Okay.
Maharaj, could you please let us know what is the question for the group number one? Group number one, question five. Thank you, ma'am. About Prakriti and Purush as the cause of the universal creation. What is the Vaishnava response? Okay. Can I, can I create the room, Maharaj? Yes. The question is, in what way was the Lord? In what way was the Lord dissatisfied with the Vaishnava or create the world? Yeah, now the word number is what way.
So we will need one spokesman for each group. Yes? I'll uh, dissolve the groups, Maharaj. Yes. All right, who's in group one? Who's the spokesman for group one? First, uh, it's uh, uh, closing the break. Oh, take, take a minute then. Eh? Okay. Who's <laughs> Yes, yeah, Now everybody's back to the main room. Okay. So the we'll hear from the smoke spokesman for group number one uh, answering question number five. How does the Vaishnava respond to the claim that Prakriti and Purusha are the cause of the universal creation? Yes, uh, Hare Krishna Dhanvat Pranam Guru Maj. So in the purport it is described that because both the Prakriti and the Purusha, they cannot exist independently of the Lord and they are the for it is the Lord who is ultimate cause of all causes. Because Prakriti and uh, Purusha cannot exist independent from the Lord and are uh, emanations from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So therefore, uh, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the cause of all causes. Okay, so the Supreme Lord, he is the cause himself of the Prakriti and the Purusha. Yeah, yeah, indirectly as the Purusha and directly as the Prakriti. So, therefore, he, it, it is not that without him, just alone the Prakriti and Purusha lead to the material creation. Okay. Any verses from scriptures to support this? Yeah, uh, the Aham Sarvasya Prabhu. Matta Sarvam Pravartate, where the Lord says that uh, he, it is uh, everything emanates from Him, both the material and the spiritual energy. And then the, the verse again given in the purport is from the Naradiya Puran, which again says that both the Prakriti and Purusha, which are inferior and superior energies, are emanations from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, again, and also Brahma Samhita Prabhu 5.1. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, Brahma Samhita is there. And again, in the uh, 15th chapter where the Lord says, I enter Gama Vishya, so without Him the Prakriti won't work. Okay. So, on the superficially it may look like it's the Purusha and Prakriti, but behind it is the Supreme Personality of God. And that Purusha, that is, that is the Lord Himself, or that is who? Huh? Who, who is? I thought the Purusha. The Purusha. I thought the Lord. Yeah. I thought the Lord Himself is the Purusha. Who is the Purusha here? Yeah, when they are questioning here, Guru Maharaj, they are referring to the even the I think the living entities who are trying to enjoy from the Lord. They are also termed as Purusha. Yes, right. They are also described because they are trying to enjoy without the Lord. So the living entities yes. are given that they are described as being Purusha. Okay, thank you. All right, the group, group number two, the difference between Sakama and Akama devotees and the spiritual disadvantage of being a Sakama devotee. Hare Krishna Maharaj, two of our uh, 
where students would actually answer one on the Sakama and one on the Akama. Okay. I would request Mr. Patit Palan Prabhu to please speak on the Sakama devotees. <laughs> So, uh, Sarkama devotees, as described over here, are the devotees of the Lord, basically demigods who are promoted to the higher planet systems. So, they're devotees, but at the same time, they have the desire to enjoy uh, the material world and uh, they pray to the Lord for uh, this particular benediction or when they're in trouble or they're put into any calamities or difficulties. So that's why I described the Sarkama devotees as the one that immediately pray to the Lord as soon as there is a difficulty. So these are the Sarkama devotees. Prabhu, over to you for Sarkama. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my good words. For here, the, the Prabhupada mentions in the corporate that the Akama devotees, uh, even if the Akama devotees are suffering, he, he thinks that this is because to his. Uh, past impious activity, he agrees to suffer the consequences and he does not disturb the Lord at all. And so he is a, a pure devotee and he doesn't uh, care about his suffering of this material disease and uh, he takes it as his own karmas. Okay, can you, uh, are there some scriptural references to support this? Can you give a scriptural reference about the Akama? Pralad Maharaj, which we have Pralad Maharaj, and uh, then we have that uh, shloka in Chaitanya Charitamrita, which says, Mukti uh, Mukti Siddhi Kamiya Kali Ashanta, Krishna Bhakta Nishkama Adeva Shanta. So he is the Akama devotee who is always Shanta and peaceful. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj, just to summate the whole thing, mm -hmm. as we see from this particular verse, which is 6940 here, which is being given for us for this discussion, here the demigods are practically worshipping all the different, almost various incarnations in the form of Narasimha, in the form of Vamana, Rama, Krishna, Hayagriva, as we see here, uh, because each of these incarnations, when they appear, they actually help the demigods to overcome various kinds of uh, impediments. Most of the time they were actually victims of the aggression of the demons. So they were rescued from that. So keeping in, in line with the same move here, uh, when the attack of Dhritarashtra was unbearable, the demigods were also taking shelter of these different uh, incarnations of the Lord. So uh, Prabhupada, on the, as a putting as a contrast, the difference between the Sakama and Akama devotees. He refers that the Sakama devotees, as Patit Prabhu said, that they are spread over in all different planetary systems and uh, they take shelter of the Supreme Personality of God when they are in danger, uh, either through the agency of Brahma or directly through what they means. And uh, they try to overcome because they are having selfish interests. And whereas Akama devotees, such as great personalities. Here, this scriptural reference is given from 10.14.8 of Lord Brahma, saying that So they just try to continue and accept whatever is coming into their life as part of their own reactions and would neither complain to the Lord nor make a request for any rescue. So this attracts the attention and the affection of the Lord towards such devotees and thereby the protection is always guaranteed and assured. Whereas with demigods, the Lord generally engages them to do some kind of a material activity to look for material kinds of solutions. Like when the, uh, the demons attack the, uh, the demigods, before the, the Lord was pleased with the, the prayers of the demigods and engaged them in doing the churning of the milk uh, ocean activity. Here also in this case of Rathasur, uh, the Lord engaged them to go and take shelter of another a sage such as the Dichi and begged from him for the uh, bones with which he could the Indra could make the thunderbolt. So the difference what we could see is like in the case of uh, uh, the, the uh, Akama devotees, the Lord personally is present just like in the Pandavas case or in the case of Prahlad Maharaj. So we could very clearly see the contrast between the two that when it is devotees who are Sakama, 
they are generally given material solution through material means, whereas for the Akama devotees, the Lord directly, personally graces them. The Lord graces them. And what do you mean He graces them? How does He grace them? What does He give them? Oh, I can't hear you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah. The Lord personally gives them assurance and as well as directly their protection. Rather, He Himself personally gets involved into it because it is a pure devotee who is actually offering the prayers and that uh, generates an affection within the, within the Lord and He reassures them and removes the obstacles Himself. Does a pure devotee, you know, the one who is Akama, will he still offer prayers to the Lord? If he if he is not going to ask the Lord for any protection, he's not going to ask the Lord for help, will he still offer prayers? Yes, Maharaj. With all his heart and mind and energy, he does that. But he won't pray, he won't answer. The prayers will be of a different nature if he's not going to ask for protection. He doesn't want anything from the Lord. Yes. Uh, the kind of prayers that what he would actually offer to the Lord would be that uh, which is pleasing to the Lord because uh, uh, he does not consider the material um, distress or the sufferings uh, to be caused by anything else other than his own actions or by the providence and uh, he does not want to disturb the Lord under any circumstances that is the kind of a mood that he has. So how, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to understand how he will pray, you know, that he doesn't have any, most, he doesn't want anything, doesn't want to ask anything. So when he offers a prayer, what will he, what's he going to do, what's he going to describe? Yeah, his, his prayers would still be glorifying the Lord's mercy or his pastimes his uh, uh, qualities and so on. So, Nama Rupa Leela Guna is the Svarana that he always does and bears the suffering as his own uh, reactions of his past activities. So, we have some examples of these kind of prayers? Uh, yes, just like Prahlad Maharaj in the whole of the seventh canto, if you see, especially after he had uh, killed um, uh, Hirana Kashipo. He offered so many prayers to pacify the Lord. Each of these prayers, if you say, see, uh, even though the Lord wanted to award him a benediction, he was repeatedly saying to him, I have already born in the family of the demons, so please do not uh, allure me with these things, because I have already seen how my father was completely perished, being attracted to these material things. Rather, he would always request that, may I be engaged in such a service which pleases you, and especially to that of your servants who are on the mission of pleasing you, spreading your glories everywhere. So he did not actually ask for any personal protection at all. During even he was being harassed and uh, really put into so much of suffering. Can the pure, de what about the pure devotees when they ask uh, for devotional service? Yes, Maharaj, because the the essence of their prayers is always to engage themselves more and more in the devotional service. And for that purpose, they do not even mind. Just like how we say that uh, these uh, Narayana Para devotees, Kutaschana uh, Vidyate, because for them, Svargapa Varga Narakasya Tulyartha Darshanam, it is for them, it appears to be the same because their vision and their mood is not of which is of this material, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, viewpoint, they would see things as a higher purpose. They would like to become an instrument in the hands of the Lord and to make His glory become the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, we have nice prayers like that. We know uh, Brahma Samhita also, Lord Brahma, He doesn't ask for anything. He's just describing the beauty and the describes the uh, Lord's energies and he describes the Lord's expansions and describes the Lord's home and the Lord's appearance. But there's no request for anything. 
So we can pray like that. It's not, it's not like when we pray that we have to ask for something. We have prayers like uh, Uddhava, he wanted to take birth in Vrindavan as a blade, of glass, a, a blade of grass so that he could get the dust from the feet of the gopis. And Brahma also wanted to become the servant of a resident of Vrindavan. So these kind of prayers, they're not material. It's a, a spiritual request. If we, if we want something which will increase our devotional service, then that's allowed, that kind of prayer. If we just want to do devotional service or to improve our devotional service or to do better devotional service, then we can pray like that. But if we pray for our sense gratification, then it's not good, right? You agree? Yes, Maharaj. It may be very interesting and nice also to remember the Chaitanya Sikshastaka, the eighth verse, when the Lord is teaching us how one could actually pray despite whether the Lord actually embraces or tramples him. He still continues to be the, his only shelter. Yeah. Usually we say that where the Lord says, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, all I want is devotional service, birth after birth. All right? I don't want wealth or followers or anything. I just want devotional service, birth after birth. The fourth verse. So Prabhupada quotes that, he said, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is not even asking for liberation. He just wants devotional. So that is the mood of the pure devotee. So the other part of the question was, uh, what are the spiritual disadvantages of being a Sarkama devotee? Uh, yes, Maharaj, we couldn't have much time to discuss on that, but I would like to just uh, uh, say a few points on that. Yes. That's what I understand of one. Uh, by uh, disadvantages of uh, being on the, as a, on the platform of the Sarkama devotees is, the material nature and the benefits that we might get due to such prayers to the Lord uh, would actually give us more and more impetus to become uh, uh, attached to the fruits of that. And we, we always spark on this, okay, I have a trouble, I can always pray and I can get my results back. But there is no awakening of uh, the mood of service, which is the essence of the spiritual nature. So, and also even in terms of associating with those who are advanced spiritually. So these two things would be absent. And that's why by becoming only a Sakama prayer, we might not uh, get the result, a desired result in terms of spiritual benefit. An example that could be given is that of Aditi. Uh, when she was uh, very much uh, aggrieved by uh, their, her sons being uh, dispositioned from the so heavenly planets after Bali Maharaj took over the whole heavens. Uh, she repeatedly requested her husband Kashyapamuni to suggest what she should do. So he request, he suggested her to perform a Bhayavatta uh, for Lord Vasudeva. She did that. And she had also offered very ecstatic prayers to the Supreme Lord at that, in this, during those prayers. But yet she had a great desire to have her son's uh, association and their safety and so on. She didn't really request for a pure devotional service. She did not actually ask for it. So that wouldn't arise within their hearts. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu. We'll go on. Group number three. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. So this, this, this question answers the question you were asking to the last to the last group that what kind of prayer we can do. So here it says that Lord is pleased when we ask for the pure devotional service and we fix our mind onto Him. But uh, uh, Lord was very displeased with the demigods even though they got an opportunity to pray to the Lord. They could have asked for the pure devotional service but they did not ask for it and they asked for the material benefit to get their kingdom back. So that made him um, uh, very sad. He, he was regretting that why did they not ask for the pure devotion? I could have given them the pure devotional service. <laughs> they didn't ask for it, so they didn't get it, huh? Yes. 
Okay. And then group four? Yeah, so continuation of uh, the, the topic which Devapadma Mataji just spoke. Again, this is uh, the, the message, the reply the Supreme Personality as Godhead has uh, given to the demigods. He says, when the misers seek Kripanas approach uh, the Supreme God for some material benefits out of their ignorance without understanding their self-interest, the Lord will not give them what they desire. Instead, he will uh, induce them to forget about what they desire uh, in that materialistic uh, uh, expectation. Instead, he will give them the desire to do the devotional activities. Uh, so, Srila Prabhupada explains here with the support of uh, a shloka from Chaitanya Charitamrita, where uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explains uh, uh, describes the glories of devotional service. So this uh, shloka is from Madheli last 22nd chapter 39th uh, shloka. Ame vidya e murthe vishaya kene diva swa charanamrita diya vishaya bhulaiva. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says that uh, because I am intelligent, these foolish people, when they ask for this material prosperity, why should I give them the, uh, what they want instead, I will induce them to take shelter uh, of my lotus feet and forget this material uh, uh, enjoyment. And here Vishwanath Chakravarti comments uh, from this uh, shloka uh, with the analogy of uh, the mother and son. Like when a son foolishly asks uh, the mother to give, her, give him uh, poison to drink, the mother will not do so, even if she loves her son so much and she would uh, prefer to do whatever her son asks for, in, the mother will not give the poison to son. So for the Kripanas, for the materialistic people, these material benefits are like poison, uh, which is going to trap them into this vicious cycle of uh, uh, repeat, repetition of birth and death. So uh, Prabhupada ends this uh, topic uh, by saying that this intelligent person, the Brahmanas, they will only ask for, for the service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And they want the, the liberation from this material bondage so that they can go back to their uh, Swarupa, their original home, and they can resume their uh, uh, Swarupa of being the servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yeah, and he also says that this is the real self-interest for uh, all the human beings. And um, yeah, um, Shivangi Mataji would like, would you like to add something? To my detect is done. It's okay. okay. Right. Yeah. Srila Prabhupada get... also, Yes, sorry, go, sorry, go, go. One more point. Yes, go uh, ahead. We can also take an example of Srila Prabhupada um, that um, he wanted to become uh, like a big uh, business magnet in his pharmaceutical uh, business. But the Supreme Personality of God and his God, some other plan, he, he, took, uh, he took away all the possessions of Srila Prabhupada, but he has engaged him in the Bhagavata uh, uh, you know, service of writing narration for both for Srila Bhagavata. Yeah. Okay. Is it in, in that section, Prabhupada also talks about the, the Brahma, uh, Kripana and Brahmana, right? Yes. The Kripana, the miserly person who is in the bodily conception of life. And the Brahmana who is a generous person. You give everything. He wants to give everything for the service of others. Nothing is not, is not selfish. Kripana is very selfish. It's only thinking of his own enjoyment. So materialistic life is like that. So you, you can see also uh, 
真。Devotee doesn't worry much about material situation. He accepts everything as the plan of the Lord. And Prabhupada said, for a devotee, no difference between living and dying. Yeah, can you explain this, Seva Padma Maharaji? No difference between living and dying. How could we explain this to a non-devotee? Because the devotee is always in, sorry, engaged in the service of Krishna. So in this world also he is doing the service to Krishna and when he leaves also he will go and engage in the service of Krishna. Oh, you serve Krishna here and you go on and serve Krishna some other place, eh? Yes, so he will be always engaged in the service of Krishna. Just like if you're working for some big company, they may send you to some one place to serve there for some time, and after some time they may send you to another place. Yes. So in the same lifetime you may be working in the same job, but they may put you in different places, different parts of the world. So in the same way in the service of Krishna, in this life we're serving Krishna somewhere, in the future we'll go on and serve Krishna some other place. Yes. Prabhu quoted the verse, Narayana parasarve nakachascinya vibhyate svarga apavarga narakesh. Svarga apavarga So devotee doesn't mind to go to hell for Krishna, right? You ready to go to hell for the service of Krishna? Yes. Yeah, because hell becomes heaven when Krishna is there. Yes. If we take Krishna with us, if we, if we keep our Krishna consciousness, hell becomes heaven. Prabhupada went to the UK, you know, he went to London and then he, it, you know, he was there, it was winter time, it was not pleasant. No, England never has very pleasant weather, every day wet and cold and windy. <laughs> so, he was being interviewed and the reporter asked him, Swamiji, what, what is it like in hell? And Prabhupada immediately said to the reporter, he said, this is hell, this place, London. He said, this is hell. He said, every day cloudy, never see the sun. Every day, wet, windy, he said, this is hell. <laughs> But he still, he said, it's a great credit to you British people that you've built up so many nice build, so many buildings in this place, in this hell. So devotee doesn't mind. If you go to heaven without Krishna, it becomes hell. You know, some people think, oh, I want to go there, I want to go to this, you know, but they have no Krishna consciousness, it just becomes a hell. It just becomes a, they just go for their sense gratification. So the devotee's business is to think of Krishna, to serve Krishna. And Prabhupada makes the point in the purport, verse number 39, he said, simply by serving Krishna, serving the Lord, he serves everyone. Everyone is being served by serving the Supreme Lord. How does that work, Vrinda Mataji? Is it? What's your Mataji's name? Is it Vrinda? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah. Can you explain to me how everybody is served by serving Krishna? By serving Krishna, how is it everyone is served? You have any experience yeah. of that? Of Godhead, all the 33 crores of Devadevatas are also served and they become satisfied. Is that what the Lara trying to ask? Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, because uh, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the origin of all the, uh, uh, the, the demigods. And uh, as uh, Srila Prabhupada gives the uh, example with the tree, when we water the root of the tree, 
all the parts of the tree get nourished. And when we supply food to our stomach, all the parts of our body get nourished. Similarly, when we serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and he uh, seated in everyone's heart as Paramatma, everyone uh, becomes satisfied. Okay, yes, very good, right. Okay, uh, there's one more point, an important point there. If you look to the purport of text number 34, Prabhupada talks about the Mayavadi philosophy. We're all, you know, it's, we're, Prabhupada's mission is preaching the message of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Gauravani Pracharini, Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Desatari. He's preaching the message of Lord Chaitanya to defeat impersonalism and voidism. So this impersonalism is very prominent in the world as well, as well as atheism. There's also a lot of impersonalism. So Prabhupada does give a good deal of attention to defeating impersonal philosophy. And it comes up in text number 34. Yeah, he writes, uh, According to the Mayavadi philosophy, just at the end of the purport there, text 34, according to this Mayavadi philosophy, the Supreme Truth, being all-pervasive, does not need a transcendental form. The Mayavadis suppose that since, since his form is distributed everywhere, he has no form. Right? How do we argue against this? Can, we, can you think of some example which we might be able to use to present to others to defeat this philosophy? Yes? Just like if uh, Prabhupada gives the example of the sun, and if we keep a lot of pots here, so every, every pot will have the sunlight as a sun reflection. So that doesn't mean the sun is not there. Okay. So you're talking about the, the all-pervasive per, all nature of the sun, that the sun's rays go everywhere. Yes, well, you can see the, the sun itself in every, each and every pot, but the ordinal sun is still there. So just like the Lord is all pervaded, but the ordinal form of the Lord is still there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, when it's a reflection, and the, you have the original object, and then the, the reflection of the sun is seen on the water. So the Mayavadis, they're saying that because the Lord is everywhere, that He cannot be in one place. He can't, that if, if, we, if we take everything as being the energy of the Lord, then the Lord won't exist anymore because their philosophy is based on transformation. That the Lord, that the, 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 the Supreme transforms Himself into different elements of the material world. Just like they say when Krishna comes, the, we're just, the, the Mayavadis, they will say Krishna comes from the Brahman. The, it's, they say the Brahman is the Supreme and when Krishna comes, He's a manifestation of the mode of goodness. He's come from the Brahman. They don't say Krishna is the Supreme and the Brahman comes from Him. They say Krishna comes from the Brahman. And they're saying ultimately everything is illusion. And it's not real. And there's no form. And of course, They will say, there's no such thing as energy. There's no transcendental energy. They say, 
there's only the Brahman, only the oneness. So how, how to defeat this? Have you got some sloka you can quote? Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Yes. Hare Krishna. Yeah, uh, recently, Guru Maharaj, I was hearing Srila Prabhupada, he gives the example of uh, even a father producing many children, but that doesn't mean that the father is finished. Like, he, it's the father's energy, but at the same time, the father maintains his individuality. And he would quote the Om Purna Mada Purna Vidam Shloka, that it is not like monoism, like it's not a material... Uh, arithmetic that when you take away everything finishes the spiritual substance is always full that, that's what Srila Prabhupada would put this slok okay yeah this is a good slok the Purnam right Om Purnam Purnam complete the example was given if you have a book and you take a page out of the book the book is no more complete so my bodies are materialists, they cannot understand the energy of the Supreme Lord, how so many units can come from Him, but He can remain complete. That is His transcendental nature. And the demigods, they've been talking about this in their prayers, which they were offering, of course, they, off they offered these prayers. They said, the Lord is transcendental to all these contradictions. The demigods' prayers are very, they're very deep because they're demigods, they're very intelligent people, these demigods, you know, they're very, very intelligent, they have a high intellect. So they offer these prayers and they, they, they talk about the contradictions which are there in the Lord and how the Lord is transcendental. These contradictions only appear to the minds of the materialistic people, the non-devotees. One of the questions they ask actually is, why, why these non-devotees cannot see the Lord? Why is He not visible to them? Do you know the answer? Why is it these non-devotees are not able to see the Lord? The demigods can see Him, they pray to Him. Why can the non-devotees not see the Lord? Yeah, one person? They don't want to see, they don't want to believe. So Lord said, okay, as you wish. Yeah, they don't want to see the Lord. Why not? Why don't they want to see the Lord? Hare Krishna. Brahma Samhita Brahma says that Premaan Chana 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 Bhakti Vilo Chana Chana They don't have the devotion to see the Lord. They don't have the transcendental eyes to see the Lord. Hare Krishna Mahara. Well, that's a very rare thing to have that Prem. You make it... In this chapter... Huh? Hare Krishna. In this chapter, uh, in one shloka it is uh, referred to People want to become God. Yes, that's right. That's the answer, right? In shloka number 25, mm. yeah, in shloka number 25, people, uh, the non-devotees, the conditioned souls can't see God because if they think even they are God, and so they are in the Right, because they, are, they want to be God themselves. They don't want to see somebody else's God. They want to be the Supreme themselves. They're thinking like that. Then non-devotees, right? They don't want to see God. So the Mayavadis, how do they see everything? How do they see the world? How does a Mayavadi see everything? Yes, right. And they say it. Yeah, they, they say Brahman Satyam Jagat Mitya, right? 
that the Brahmana's truth in this world is all false, it's not real. So they don't, they see this world like that. They don't see any reality or any truth in the world. What do we say? We say everything is the energy of the mind, the separated energy, the Bhairanga Shakti. Mm. Okay. Mangas? Yes? <clears throat> we say it's, it's not false. This material world is not false, but it is temporary. Right, right. It's not false, but it's temporary, right. It's real, right. Prabhupada said, if I take my shoes and beat you on the head with them, it's real. <laughs> right? So we, we argue, we have, to, we have to deal with these Mayavadi philosophy, we have to deal with this Mayavadi philosophy. We have, we have to explain that there is such a thing as transcendental energy and there is spiritual form, not just only material form. They're only, the Mayavadis only think in terms of matter and material forms. They're thinking in the spiritual world there can be no form. They think if there's a form in the spiritual world, then it would be again suffering. And they think it must be misery, and it must be, there must be old age and disease. They don't understand that there can be a spiritual form, transcendental to the material miseries. So we have to try to preach. How to preach to these Mayavadi people? Very difficult. Very difficult to argue with them. What's the best thing to do? How do you preach to them? By giving them Krishna prasadam. Very good, yes, that's a good idea. Give them nice prasadam, yes. And kirtan, the holy name, nice kirtan and nice prasadam. These are our weapons to, can, to change the minds of these materialistic, these Mayavadi people who are bewildered by this atheistic philosophy. Actually, Mayavadi philosophy is just atheism. Because they say, ultimately, they say, if everybody's God, then there's no meaning to God. Because they're saying like that, they're saying, ultimately, we're all one. Ultimately, we're all God, we're all the Supreme. So this is just like atheism. There's no purpose to being God at all. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes? In, in this context, just wanted to have a little clarification. <clears throat> uh, we generally attribute that the Brahmavadis and the uh, Mayavadis to be something similar, where we see that the Mayavadis are the ones who derive the form of the Lord, and uh, they also derive to an extent something which is spiritual or transcendental. Whereas Brahmavadis are the ones who take to the trouble and the path of understanding that uh, we are spirit souls and we are just not the matter, we are covered by this matter and so on. Uh, the, 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 the gross atheists and the, uh, these Mayavadis who uh, deny the form of the Lord, uh, they consider that everything is a combination of the matter and so ultimately everything is matter and if matter is destroyed, with that everything is destroyed. And so there's no need for any special endeavor to be done or to cultivate ourselves to be different from that. Even though they are seeing on their face so many different kinds of results happening, they simply try to attribute this to be as changes of uh, the material nature. Whereas the sincere Brahmavadis, they make step by step an effort to understand and even they try to reach up to the Brahma Jyoti also. Because they are not denying the form of the Lord in, in terms of his energy and considering themselves to be the part of the energy of the Lord. I mean part of the big energy even though they don't know whether it is the Supreme Lord and so on. So the subtle difference between the Brahmavadis and these Mayavadis, uh, uh, usually we devotees when we come into 
understanding this philosophy, there's a lot of uh, uh, mix up on these two. Uh, are there some clarities of how one should differentiate between these two? If you can please enlighten us on that. Well, the main differentiation is that the, the Brahma Vadis don't commit any offenses. The Mayavadi was a Mayavadi Aparadi because they deny the form of the Lord. But the Brahmavadi doesn't deny the form of the Lord. He just only talks about the Brahman. Like the four Kumaras, they went into the spiritual world. They're Brahmagyanis. Now, they'd heard about the Lord. Lord Brahma had told them about the Lord. But they were more attracted to the Brahman initially. And they went into the Brahman. And then they went into Vaikuntha and then they met the Lord. And after meeting the Lord, then they changed. But they didn't commit any offenses. So that's the main point. But the Maya body, they just, you know, they just outwardly reject the spiritual nature, the spiritual form of the Lord. And God, the absolute truth, cannot speak, cannot walk cannot, has no senses, has no form, like this. So this, this is offence. These are all offences committed by the Mayavadis. So the devotee wants to be very careful to guard against this uh, Mayavadi philosophy. It's very subtle, it's very cunning, you know, how the Mayavadi philosophy can penetrate, can go everywhere. It's very attractive because it, the, the attraction is that we want to, we can become God. You know, I think, wow, I can become God, I'm God, you know. <laughs> it's very appealing to people to think you can become God, you're God. And you can, if, if, if you're God, then you can do whatever you want. You don't have to follow any rules, you don't have to take any authorities, you don't have to accept any regulations, you can do whatever you like. So that's very attractive to a lot of people. They want, they want that kind of freedom. They think, oh great, no react, nobody's going to punish me, I'm not going to suffer. People think, great, just what they want. A lot of freedom, a lot of enjoyment, no rules and regulations. <laughs> so this is Mayavadi, this is what the Mayavadi philosophy offers. Of course, ultimately, it leads to the darkest ignorance, you, you put into horrible conditions of life. Like Mayavadis, they can become trees. And as trees, they will stand, because they're thinking, I'm God. So they stand as a big tree, with their feet stuck in the ground, and thinking, I am great, I am God. Or sometimes they become a mountain, and they have to be a mountain, and and, you know, Prabhupada explains, some mountains have souls, you see. And so these mayavadis, they're put into these kind of bodies. They have to become trees or souls. It's a punishment. It's, it, it's, it's their desire. It's what they want. It's not really punishment. Krishna is equal to everybody. Whatever they want, they get. They wanted to be so big, they wanted to be so powerful, so they become a big tree or a big mountain and they stand in that form for a long time. So, Hare Krishna Maharaj. On this count, I just want to understand the, the major part of the philosophy what Shankara said, was it more to do with the Mahavadi method, or was it more to do with the Mayavadi method? Well, Shankaracharya said, Mayavada asat shastram prachanam bodham uchate. The verses there, Padma Purana, that in the Kali Yuga, that Shankaracharya said he got the, uh, Lord Shiva said he got the order to come in the Kali Yuga as a Brahmana and teach the Mayavada Asat Shastra, Prachanam Buddham Chate. Prachanam Buddha covered Buddhism. Mayavada Asat Shastra. Asat Shastra, not Sat Shastra. The real Shastra is Sat, but this is Asat Shastra because it's 
Prachanambur is covered Buddhism. He's simply teaching the the the, the absolute the, the absolute is zero. He just taught zero. Oh no, my Shankaracharya taught one. Buddhism is zero and Shankaracharya made it one. So he taught everything is Brahman. Is it Brahmavadi or is it Mayavadi? It will depend. Lord Shiva, of course, he's not Mayavadi, but he came as Shankaracharya. So Shankaracharya's mission was to bring back the Vedas and to establish again the Varnashram. And he did that. He established very good Brahmanas with very good character, good qualities, because before, at the time of the Buddhism, the Brahmanas had become corrupt and degraded. And so Lord Buddha was a, re a reaction against the social system due to the degradation of the Varnashram. So he led the people away from the Varnashram and away from the Vedas because the Brahmanas were the ones who were teaching the Vedas and they were corrupt and degraded and they were killing all the animals. So Lord Buddha led the people away from the Vedas. Shankaracharya brought back the Vedas and re-established the Varnashram with good quality Brahmanas, strict Brahmanas who were disciplined, self-controlled, high standards, you see. And he brought back the Varnashram Dharma. But the people were not ready to hear about the actual Vaishnava philosophy, Shankaracharya just taught them about God. And so he taught them about, he, Prabhupada said, I was just reading today actually a quote of Prabhupada, he said that Shankaracharya would talk about God. And so before as Buddhism they don't talk about God. The Buddhists never talk about God. And they say Buddha never talks about God, Buddha's not God, he's not man, he's Buddha. He said, the, 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 you never hear the Buddhists talk about God. They only talk about zero, the, the void, the nothingness, you know, and the Buddha. They don't talk about God. They don't believe in God. Because for the Buddhists, nothing is real. So there's no, there's no creator. God is the creator. But they say the world is not real. So there's no God. That's the Buddhist idea. But Shankaracharya, he brought back in the word God. He's speaking about God, God, you know, that God, there's, it, there's, a, there's a, we're all God. <laughs> you know, at least he got people to think more about God by teaching the Mayavadi philosophy. He brought back the consciousness that there is God. And in the beginning, oh, okay, every, we're all God, everybody's God. Oh, oh very nice, very nice. <laughs> and then later on the Vaishnava Acharyas come and they explain the difference between the real God and us. So it's like that. So it's, yes. Yeah, it, 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 Maharaj it, Krishna, mm. in this regard, so this uh, Shankaracharya's follower or the Mayavadis, what scripture do they refer? Where they find that, that God is one or everybody is God? Well, Sh Shankaracharya, he wrote many commentaries on scriptures particularly Vedanta Sutra, the Shari Rakabhashya, the com famous commentary on Vedanta Sutra. So generally Mayavadi sannyasis, they all study the Vedanta Sutra. So when Lord Chaitanya went there to Benares 500 years ago, they were all there, they, they were all studying Vedanta and they wanted Lord Chaitanya to study Vedanta with them. Lord Chaitanya, he didn't want to study with them, he just wanted to chant Hare Krishna. So they thought, no, come on, you're a sannyasi, you're in our line, you should also come and study Vedanta. But then when they talked with Lord Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya, first of all, he said, no, no, my spiritual master said, I'm a fool, I cannot understand Vedanta. My spiritual master told me just to chant Hare Krishna. But then Lord Chaitanya explained to them about Vedanta. And he, def he totally changed their minds and after they heard everything from Lord Chaitanya, then they all chanted Hare Krishna. So Lord Chaitanya brought them all to Vaishnavism. 
So uh, Shankaracharya, he wrote commentaries on like the Upanishads and Vedanta Sutra and even Bhagavad Gita, his commentary is there, you know. He, he wrote even the Jagannath Astikam that, that we sing, the Jagannath, he's written that, you know. He did some nice things, you know. But so in all his commentary, he, he uh, like mentioned that like everybody is God in his commentary, he, he mentioned that. Well, it's all, it's, it's all word jugglery, you know. I haven't gone through his... Prabhupada, you, if you look in Prabhupada's purport there in the Chaitanya Charitamrita in the Adi Lila, there's a, like a, a, about four, four or six page purport where Prabhupada goes through some of the interpretations, how they interpret things in the Vedanta Sutra, you know. It's, but we have our own commentary now on Vedanta Sutra with Baladev Vijabhusan. But that's uh, Shankaracharya, you know, he, he, he must have been very active because he left the world at 32 and he, he must have, how he wrote so many things, so many commentaries. But particularly the Vedas, you know, the Vedantas people, they will study uh, the commentaries of Shankaracharya. He never touched Srimad Bhagavatam though. Prabhupada appreciated that. He thought that, that was proper because Srimad Bhagavatam is directly the glories of Krishna. So Shankaracharya never touched it. But he did, he did comment on, he, did, he has a commentary on Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads and uh, Vedanta, particularly Vedanta Sutra, that's his main work. And there's another book uh, that is uh, Govindam, the Govinda Bhashya, right? Uh, well, how does it go? Bhaji Govinda, Bhaji Govinda, Bhaji Govinda Mudamate, Rakshi Satiti Vishvaksho, Goprit Vevaranam, Taatma Nakshema Karpanye Sadvadaka. No, no, what is it? Bhaji Govinda, Bhaji Govinda Mudamate, Samprapte Nahi. Samprapte. Dukrin Karine, right. Just worship Govinda, you fools, you rascals. All of your word mental speculation and word jugglery will do you no good at the time of death. It will not save you at the time of death. So just worship Govinda. But you know what they do? If you ask, if you quote this to a Mayavadi sannyasi, they will say, no, no, it doesn't mean worship Govinda. It means something else. Bhaja Govinda doesn't mean worship Govinda. They say, no, 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 it means something totally different. You know, they're very expert to juggle, to, to give different meanings. Because Govinda, they say, no, Govinda is not Krishna. No, 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 Govinda is not Krishna. They've got that, oh, they can give, oh, they have so many, they're very expert. So don't waste your time, argue with them. Just give them prasadam, chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> okay, so we will stop here tonight. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada ki. Gore back to Vrinda ki. Hare Krishna. One question, Maharaj. Oh, okay. Uh, Sloka number 45. They asked him, why do the demigods especially pray to Krishna, not to Vishnu? Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, nice there, uh, that verse that they pray to Krishna, they don't pray to Vishnu, the, <laughs> they mention Krishna. Prabhupada explains in the purport why, the special benefit of praying to Krishna. Hmm? Because Krishna is paritranaya sadhunam vinas jaya chaduskritam. Krishna comes to destroy the demons. Krishna especially, and Krishna is very merciful to people who are in distress as well. And when Krishna sees his devotees in distress, and Krishna has a special kind, and Prabhupada, they use the word, right, the, the one who is in distress, that Krishna is, relieves people from distress. So Queen Kunti was in distress, Queen Kunti was in great distress, 
in the prayers by Queen Kunti, she prays like that also, that you, you can, you deliver the devotee from distress. Queen Kunti prays for distress. Vipada shantutashasva tatra tatra jagad. Let all the miseries happen again and again. Because she knows, Kunti knows that when she's in difficulties, Krishna will be there. Krishna, and she'll be able to remember Krishna. So the demigods also, it's the final prayer, the very last prayer which they make. They talk about Krishna, that Krishna can deliver us from the distress. In, in the commentary of, Valad, of uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, he says the demigods have become a little confused there. <laughs> he said the demigods are confused and that's why they prayed to Krishna. <laughs> They were actually praying to the super soul in the beginning, but then it became, the last verse they prayed to Krishna because they know Krishna is very kind to alleviate, to help the devotee in distress. And Krishna has special feelings for those devotees who are in difficulty and who are put into difficult conditions on behalf of Krishna. So the demigods are praying that we're your servants, Krishna, and we're in this difficult situation. So you should come and you should save us. You should help. You should kill this demon for us. <laughs> of course, Krishna is not. Vishnu is not going to do it. Krishna is not going to do it. They tell the demigods, "You do it yourself. I'm not going to kill him. You go and kill him yourself." But they gave him the sick, they told him how to do it. You have to go to Dadichi. You have to go and get the bones from Dadichi. He's, he's there. He will, he's got these bones which are really powerful, right? Because Dadichi, he also had the Narayana Kavacha. So his body is very rich in tapasya. And he'll give his bones, right? Would you like to give your bones for the demigods if they come? Please give me your bones. Ah, very nice charity, huh? Come and beg for the bones of the great yogi to make the weapon to kill Vritasura. Okay, so when we meet on Monday night, we'll hear about Dadichi, how he jokes with the demigods about giving his bones. Any other question? Hare Krishna Maharaj, just a small uh, question. No? Uh, in which category we can uh, say the prayers of uh, Gajendra? In the Sakam or Akam? <laughs> well, we have to look at the prayer and see what he's asking. Actually, after, after the Lord came and killed the crocodile, Gajendra was lamenting. He was saying that, oh, why, why, you, why you delivered him? You should, have killed, you should have delivered me. I prayed to you. But you come and you've come and you've killed the crocodile. You should have killed me. I'm still in this elephant body. If you'd kill me. But the Acharyas say, the crocodile got liberated because the crocodile was holding on to the feet of Gajendra, and Gajendra is a great devotee. So he'd taken shelter of the feet of Gajendra, so the crocodile got liberated. Gajendra hadn't taken shelter of the devotee. <laughs> he just approached the Supreme Lord. So he had to stay in the material world longer. But he prayed. He said, I don't, want, I don't want this body any longer. I can't talk being in this elephant body. It's really tough. You know, they have these two elephants in Mayapur. I see them as well. You know, it's really tough, really difficult to be in that body, to be an elephant. Not easy at all. Big body, so big. What they eat how they live, have to 
put this big chain around the leg. <laughs> So, generally the Gajendra's prayers are considered pure devotion. Considered pure devotion. Everything in the Bhagavatam is going to be is pure. Of course, Gajendra was in distress, so the distress helped him to pray to the Lord. But that distress brought him to the mood of pure devotion. Just like Dhruva Maharaj was praying for the kingdom, but when he got the kingdom, he didn't want it. Right? He'd become a pure devotee. After becoming a pure devotee, he didn't want any. So Gajendra also, because he, he saw the Lord and he become purified, he didn't want he didn't want anything anymore. So actually, of course. The, the highest level of pure devotion, they won't pray to the, as we heard today, that in the, this purpose to the demigods, that the Akama devotee, he won't pray, he tolerates whatever situation he's in, he'll just tolerate it. Krishna's mercy, Krishna's put me in this condition, just let me tolerate it. Just like in Chaitanya Leela, that Brahmana Vasudeva, his body was being eaten by worms. And sometimes the worms would fall out. He would pick it up and put it back in his body to eat the flesh. And so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came there and saw him. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came and embraced him. And after Mahaprabhu had embraced him, his body became transformed and he was rejuvenated. It became young, it became young and strong and good looking. Before his body was all diseased, it was being eaten by worms. But after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu embraced him, he was totally rejuvenated, he became effulgent. But the, the, the Vasudev said to Lord Chaitanya, he said, what will I do now? He said, he said, I will want sense gratification. He said, this is not good, I don't want this healthy body. He said, there will be a problem, how will I be able to be fixed in my sadhana? With this body, I may think about sense gratification. I have a healthy, strong body now. I may want to enjoy material world. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Mahaprabhu told him, said, so you have to always chant the holy name and you have to preach Krishna consciousness. And that will protect you. So that's the idea. You've got to stay in Krishna consciousness. Even if you are got a healthy, strong body, <laughs> even if you're, you, don't, you don't want it, but you have to take whatever situation Krishna puts you in. But devotee won't pray for anything. You just, tate nu kampam, so just tolerate all the adverse conditions. Krishna's, okay, it's my karma. We accept it all due to reactions due to my past deeds. Right? So, Sadaya Bhak, this person is qualified to become my unalloyed devotee. And the Acharyas say, what, what does the son have to do to inherit the property of the father? You know, what does the son have to do to inherit the property of the father? He just has to stay alive, that's all. One day the father will die <laughs> and then the son will get all the property of the father. So the, the same way, you just have to stay alive in Krishna consciousness. You have to stay in Krishna consciousness. Don't give up Krishna consciousness and in that way you're sure to go back to Godhead. Even though we go through hell, we go through everything, just hold on to Krishna and then one day we'll go back to Godhead. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada ki.